If you care to follow along, I'm going to be in Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. And I'm going to read verses 17 to 22. And thou shalt put into the ark the... Wait a minute, I just skipped where I was reading. Yeah, that's, that's right, I'm sorry. Oh. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on one end and the other cherub on the other end even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherub cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee, I will give thee, in commandment unto the children of Israel. I read something the other day. This is a quote from J.I. Packer. I don't know a lot about J.I. Packer, but I like this quote. He said this, Were I asked to focus the New Testament message in three words. My proposal would be adoption through propitiation. And I do not expect ever to meet a richer or more pregnant summary of the gospel than that. I like that. Adoption through propitiation. Now, as we're going to see, what I'm going to try and preach here today, what that actually can be translated to is adoption through the mercy seat. Through the mercy seat. Because that is what the word in the New Testament, we'll get into it a little bit. In the New Testament, when they use the word propitiation, it actually <laughs> means mercy seat. It means expiation. Advocacy through blood. I like that, I do. But anyhow, I thought that was good. Adoption through propitiation. Unfortunately, for some of these things, you need to keep a dictionary nearby when you get some of them. But that's all right. So, Exodus 25 is the beginning of the instructions for the creation of the tabernacle. The materials of the building of the tabernacle are to come, it says in verse 2, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring unto me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. It is to come from the willing offerings of the people to build this tabernacle. And the list of materials is given from verse 3 to verse 7. Great materials. Great materials. What is it? This is the offering which you shall take of them. Gold, silver, and brass. Blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. I love that. Fine linen. And goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. Oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. That's the list of materials starting out here in Exodus 25. Precious metals, precious stones, beautiful colors, fine linens, skins, oil, and spices. 
These are to be offered to the Lord willingly. Willingly. And then he explains to Moses why. Why, are, why am I asking you to take up this offering? Verse 8 says this. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Oh, I like that. Let them make. This is a privilege for the people of God, for the congregation of Israel. Let them make me a sanctuary, a separate place, exclusively for the Lord, for the Lord. Because this sanctuary is for the Lord. Let them make me a sanctuary. Oh, I like that. The tabernacle, the whole thing, is for the Lord. It's not for man. It's for the Lord. Now, it's a place of sacrifices, and it's a place of offerings. Oh. There is a benefit to man in the sanctuary, in that tabernacle. But that sanctuary was for the Lord. There's a difference. It's called the tent of the congregation, but only God's high priests and priests got to go in that tent of the congregation. This is to be a sanctuary for the Lord because it is God's tent, God's tabernacle, surrounded by God's yard, God's courtyard, a courtyard around it. And this is to be separate from the tents of Israel and at the same time in the midst of them. He's going to tell us all this later. I'm just giving you an overview. This is a a sanctuary for the Lord. Now, why a sanctuary? Well, God told us. And let them make me a sanctuary that that. Here's the purpose. I may dwell among them. Let's be clear. Okay? Don't, 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 don't be distracted by this. God was with them the whole way from Egypt. God was with them in Egypt. But now he says, I want a sanctuary and I'm going to dwell with my people. I'm going to dwell with them. From Egypt to right here, out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, the whole way. Matter of fact, when they were sitting at the edge of the Red Sea, before they crossed over, there was a wall of fire behind them that kept the Egyptian army at bay. Oh, God was with them. God was there. Oh, and before they crossed the Red Sea, Moses made that great statement. Stand still. Stand still. What? And see the salvation of the Lord. Oh, that's a great statement. Oh, grace and mercy right there. Stand still. What does that mean? Don't move. Well, don't walk. Don't twitch. Don't even try to help. The salvation of the Lord is in the Lord's hands. Oh, I like that, I do. The parting, and here's the thing, that parting of the Red Sea was salvation to Israel, to the congregation of Israel. But I'm going to tell you something, that parting of the Red Sea was nothing but death to that Egyptian army. Because after they had passed through and then Pharaoh's army came through, it came down on them and drowned them to a man. The parting of the Red Sea was salvation to the Israelites, and it was damnation to the Egyptians. Oh, my. Is that too hard? It's still true. It's still true, whether it's hard or not. That's just the way it is. You understand, a lot of people think it's okay for God to have killed people in the Old Testament, but you can't do it now. Y'all don't know God. That's all I can tell you. 
Oh, my. But here it is. God was with them all through their journey. But he says, now, now make me a sanctuary. What? Now I will dwell among them. I will dwell among them, permanently reside in the midst of them. I'm going to live, and I like this, among them, among them. Oh, I like that, that I may dwell among them. Oh, that's good stuff. I'm going to tell you something. The Israelites were going to know where God was and where God is. I'm going to dwell among them. Make me a sanctuary. I'm going to dwell among you. Here's the thing. The Israelites, the congregation of Israel, knew where God was. The heathen still didn't. That's from last week. That'll work. The heathen won't know, but the congregation of Israel shall know that I am right here in the midst. This is the purpose of the tabernacle. Emmanuel. God with us, God with us, because this shows here God's desire to be among his people, and he shall, he shall. He said, I will, so you know it's going to happen, I will, but verse 21, the mercy seat, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark. After all of the ark and the mercy seat is built. That's what happens here. He tells them how to build it. And what is it? Verses, what is it? Uh, verse 10 through verse 20. You'll see the instructions for building the ark and the mercy seat. And understand this. This is the instruction for the whole tabernacle. There's a lot more yet to come. But where does God start giving Moses the instructions? He starts with the ark and the mercy seat. You understand? That's the central piece, the central place for the presence of God at this time was going to be the ark and the mercy seat. This is it. And here's what he say about that mercy seat that he had made of solid gold with a cherubims on top of it, also of gold. <coughs> I love this part. Off after, he said, and thou shalt put the mercy seat, and here it is, above upon the ark. I like that. The mercy seat is put above upon the ark. Above the ark is the mercy seat. And upon the ark is the mercy seat. I like that. Because this ark is Christ. And this mercy seat is Jesus Christ also. Pictured. Oh, the mercy seat is above upon the ark. Ah. And what happens there on this mercy seat? That is where the blood is applied. The blood is sprinkled by the high priest once a year on the day of atonement. The blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat. I know this is, might be a fine point, but I, I, it, it, it kind of hit me. Because the mercy seat seals the top of the ark. It is put above but upon the ark. Because the ark is... I did not know this growing up, you know. You hear things about the ark and ark, and I always thought about Noah's ark, okay? But I've heard things about the ark. The ark, according to the Bible, the ark is a box. Now, it is one grand and glorious box. But that's what it is. It's an open-top box. And the mercy seat is put above it and upon it. To what? To seal that ark. Because here's the thing. The blood sprinkled on the mercy seat does not enter the ark. Yeah, I, 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 I know. It's, you know. The blood shed 
by our Lord Jesus Christ did not change his perfection. He in himself is without sin. Even when his blood was shed, he took our sins. And it says he took our sins in his body on the tree. It says that God made him to be sin, what? Who knew no sin. Yeah, him who knew. For us. That's right, Jack. For us. But here's the thing. That blood shed on that mercy seat never entered that ark. It didn't change the ark whatsoever. That ark was still perfect. And Jesus Christ, even though all our sins were upon him, and he willingly took them upon him, that did not change his sinless perfection. He was the perfect, absolute, complete sacrifice for sin. Oh, I like that. Because he took in himself our sins, was made to be sins for us, and he still perfect and sinless and holy. Oh my, his sacrifice and offering is just right above his perfection on this picture of the mercy seat in the ark. Above upon his perfection. The blood is shed because he is the ark. He is the mercy seat. And it's his blood that is shed, that is sprinkled. Oh, I like that. Everything in this tabernacle pointed to Christ, especially this ark and this mercy seat. Hmm. Now, thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. The testimony was put in the ark. The perfect testimony went in the perfect ark. I like that. Now, but pay very close attention here to what goes in the ark. What does man have to do with the testimony in the ark? Well, the answer to that is absolutely nothing. What does it say? Thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. That's verse, the end of verse 21. I'm going to give it to you. Here's the thing. Your testimony, my testimony, even the testimony of Moses doesn't go in that ark. The Lord's testimony goes in that ark. What does that mean? Witness. The testimony of the ark's perfection is the Lord's witness and no one else's. He'll put it in there. We're going to go into that maybe a little bit more later on here. But the Lord's testimony goes inside the ark and the mercy seat goes above and upon it. Oh, I tell you. And here's what he says. This is what kind of got a hold of me this past week. Verse 22. We've got the ark. We've got the testimony in the ark. And we've got the mercy seat above and upon the ark. And what does he say here? Verse 22. And there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Here he says, there I will meet with thee. There, in my place, in my sanctuary, at my ark, above my mercy seat. There I will, and I will, God says it again, I will meet with thee. No questions, no discussions. This is not a request. This is a commandment. I'm going to meet with you there. I'm going to meet with you there. Oh, I like that. Here we are. The Lord will not leave his people alone. 
Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. And you know what he meant by that, right? He meant, I will never leave thee and I will never forsake thee. The Lord never leaves his people alone. And even more than that, put it this way, the Lord will not leave his people on their own. On their own. You understand what Jesus Christ called himself? I am the good shepherd. You're the sheep. I'm the shepherd. That's what he says. You know what? You know who the responsible party in that relationship is? It's the shepherd, not the sheep. The sheep are irresponsible. And that's us, folks. That's us. The Lord will not leave his people on their own. I will meet with thee. I will meet with thee. Oh, and I'm going to tell you something. Here's the glory. God had made his place to meet with people. Because here's this. The Lord wants to gather with his people. And he sits in the heaven and he does whatsoever he pleases. I like that. I will meet with thee. And even more than that. What's he say? There I will meet with thee and, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. Paul made this statement, I found, at least three times. Peter almost made a same statement, but a little different. But what Paul said about three times, he said, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. What am I saying? There I will meet with thee, and there I will commune with thee. Jesus Christ communes with his people. Now, what does that word commune mean? Well, according to Strong's, it means... <coughs> Excuse me. It means command, declare, promise, promise. I like that one, and pronounce. But the the number one meaning of this word commune. Speak. What did he say? I will meet with thee, and I will speak with thee. Oh, that's good stuff. You understand? I will tell you what I want you to know. Wait a minute, folks. Look right here. You see this book? He has told us what he wants us to know. I will tell you what I want you to know. I'm going to meet with you above the mercy seat. Above the mercy seat. Oh, wait a minute. Why? Yeah, well, wait a minute. Just a minute. I'm going to speak with you. I'm going to speak with you. Now, this is the true essence of communion. God, Jesus Christ, speaks to his people, and we, believers, those who have ears to hear, listen. We are to listen. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What did God say? The Mount of Transfiguration, hear ye him. Hear him. Listen. Now, you understand, this says God's going to speak with us. It doesn't say we're going to speak with God. It just says here, God's going to speak with us. Because I do want to point this out. This may sound hard. God cares for us, but he's not looking for your opinion on his salvation. He's not looking for anybody's opinion. Understand? God deals only in facts. God deals only in truth. Everything he says is true. He doesn't need our opinion. He doesn't want it. You need to hear his words. We need to listen. Our part of communing with God is this. Yes, Lord. Well, thy will, not my will, be done. And here's the thing, Christ Jesus will send his preachers to preach his message. He communes with us. 
He speaks to us by his word. And he speaks to us through his men who've been given his message to preach his gospel. Oh, and here it is, a separate point. Where? From above the mercy seat. Above the mercy seat. Now understand, the mercy seat is above upon the ark. Above the mercy seat is where I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee. Where does God commune with men? From above the mercy seat. From above the place where the atonement was made. Above where the blood was sprinkled. Oh, what am I saying? Well, I'm saying this. Without the blood being shed, there's no meeting and there's no communion. Without the mercy seat, without propitiation, expiation, there is no way that God will speak to us. The Lord gave this design and pattern to Moses to be built this way to point to his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you without, about this. Without the mercy seat, you don't want God to speak to you. Without the blood being shed, he's not going to have anything good to say to you. Because without the atonement, the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, God has only condemnation and death for you. Thank God there is a mercy seat. And thank God the blood was shed. Oh. But from above the mercy seat. You know what God says? You know what I want to hear? You know what I need to hear from above the mercy seat? There's one thing I need to hear. One thing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's one thing you need to hear from above the mercy seat. What you need to hear is this. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's what you want to hear from above the mercy seat. Oh, I like that. I and you must have this mercy seat between ourselves and God. Jesus Christ is our Passover. Oh, I like that. And here's the thing. We do. If you know Christ, if you believe Christ, if you love Christ, if you trust Christ, that's not of yourselves, that's of God. Nobody's going to do it who's not born of God, not of man. Not of the flesh, not of the blood, not of him that willeth. Or of him that runneth, it's of God that shows mercy. But here's the thing. If you're one of those people, <coughs> we do have the mercy seat. Ah, oh, I like that. We do. What did it say? Uh, this is Romans 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus now. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. A mercy seat. An expiator. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God. Oh, I like that. The propitiation, the expiator, the expiation, Jesus Christ, our mercy seat, our propitiation, our mercy seat is a person. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, what did he go about? Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. What I tell you, that blood sprinkled didn't change the perfection of the ark. It didn't get inside the ark. 
Jesus Christ is just as righteous today as he ever was. Oh, I like that. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. He died the death that we could not die. And he actually did die. And now his people do not have to. Yes, we'll die physically. We'll cease on this planet. One day, unless he comes again. But that's not the true death. Oh, the second death will not touch those. Anyhow, he is a propitiation, a mercy seat through faith in his shed blood, and he is the propitiation. Because 1 John 4 and verse 10 says this, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the mercy seat. So in Romans 3, 25, he says, a propitiation. And John 4, 10 says, the propitiation. And you know, it's the same one. It's the same one. It's Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins. He stands between us and the holy God. He is our redemption and he is our righteousness. He is our mercy seat mercy seat and I need Jesus Christ our mercy seat our propitiation our redemption between myself and God oh I know still in my flesh dwelleth no good thing but I also know that his spirit dwells in every one of his people and when the Father looks at us, he sees Christ. When the Father looks at his people, he sees his Son, his well-beloved Son, our mercy seat. Oh, my. It says, what is it? Therefore I will meet, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, and from between the two cherubims, and upon the ark of the testimony of all the things which I give thee in commandment, unto the children of Israel. Inside this ark, I mentioned this before, I didn't go into it. Inside this ark is the testimony given by the Lord. Inside the ark. The unbroken tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on it. Now I already had this sermon done when last night Raiders of the Lost Ark came on TV. I already had this done. It had nothing to do with it. But there's Harrison Ford up there saying, oh, they put the stuff in there, that those those uh, broken broken commandments. No, 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 no. Broken commandments got thrown away. Mm -hmm. They put the whole ones in there. That's what it says. Because I, I'd heard that, and I'd heard that from preachers. Well, they put the broken law, and that way, oh, it's covered by the blood. No, 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 no. Because that ark is a picture of Christ. That law was perfectly kept by our Lord Jesus Christ. He honored the father and his mother. He did not steal. He did not kill. He loved the Lord God, excuse me, the Lord God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength all the time. I'd be happy if I could do it for a minute. He did it all the time. And he loved his neighbor as himself all the time. I don't know if I want to do that or not, but I'd like to. I really would, but uh, you'd have to know some of my neighbors. But that's okay. This is the thing. Nothing unbroken went into this. You put in this ark, he said, the testimony that I give you, and that was the unbroken tablets of stone. And then according to Hebrews 9 and 4, there is also what the golden pot that held manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Okay? That's the testimony that's inside the ark. The unbroken law that Christ Jesus kept and fully completed to the complete, total approval of the Father, the golden pot that held the bread from heaven, and Jesus Christ is the bread from heaven, 
And then the rod that budded, Aaron's rod that budded, what? Christ Jesus is the righteous branch. He's also the vine, which has within it eternal life, life within. Everything about this ark, this mercy seat, and the testimony points to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's our mercy seat, he's our propitiation, and he is our ark. Oh, I like that. Let me point about one more thing about this ark. Because all you could see of this ark was gold. Now, in the box itself, there was shittim wood. But it was overlaid. Overlaid with pure gold. All you ever saw was the gold. It had the two staves in the four rings. Four rings were gold. But those two staves were shittim wood overlaid with pure gold, pure gold. All you could see of this ark when you looked at it was gold. That's what you saw. Pure gold overlaid the ark, a pure gold mercy seat, pure gold cherubims, pure gold rings to hold the pure gold overlaid staves. And there's one more thing about this ark. One more thing. Roundabout. Round about this ark, all the way around it. What is there? There's a crown of gold. Oh, I like that. I like that. Because, yes, Christ Jesus is God and man. And he is king. He is king. Because the Lord is our king. That's it. He was king, he is king, and he ever shall be king. And even the ark showed that. It had a crown around about it. I like that. A golden crown around about it. He has not only the power to rule and reign, he has every right to rule and to reign. That's the part people want to fight about. They might be willing to admit he has the power, but it's just not right for him to do something like that. No, 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 no. If he does it, it's right. You understand? If he rules, it's right. If he reigns, it's right. Why? Because he does it. And shall not the God of all the earth, and that's Jesus Christ, do right? Yes, he'll do right. He always does. He has, he has, he has, he's both Lord and King. Isaiah wrote it and Paul quoted it. What did he say? I have sworn by myself. This is Isaiah 45 and verse 23. I have sworn by myself. This is the words of the Lord. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. And here it is, folks. The one who said that is the one that meets with his people and communes with his people. He always has, and he still does today. We don't have the tabernacle today, but that's okay. We don't need it. We have the mercy seat, Jesus Christ. We don't need that tabernacle. We have Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. What? Full of grace and truth. Our mercy seat came in the flesh. He took upon himself the form of a servant and he dwelt among us still full of grace and truth. Ah, oh, I like that. And he gave himself an offering for sin forever. He died, was buried, and rose again. Our mercy seat. And now his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwells, abides, lives in every believer, every found sheep. And he meets and communes with his people. 
Jesus Christ told us himself. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. Where? In the midst of them. In the midst of them. In the midst of them. I like that. Whether we know it or not, he's here. When we as believers gather to worship God, Jesus Christ is here. He is here. What do you got to say to that? Rejoice. And again, I say unto you, rejoice. Oh, that's good stuff. Because the sovereign, sovereign king of glory will meet and commune with his people. Oh, I like that. Oh, Understand, a couple weeks ago I preached that message about when the tabernacle was finally put together and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, filled the tent of the congregation, and Moses was not able to enter. But you understand, that's what this is talking about here. He says, well, I'm going to meet with thee and commune with thee. He actually is referencing Moses. Moses couldn't go in that tent of the congregation because there's no place for the law in the place of grace. But here it is. God still talked. God still met and God communed with his people. Oh, I like that. I do. There I am in the midst of them. What does it say? The sovereign king of glory will meet and commune with his people and he shall forevermore. Ephesians 1 and 10 says this. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. What? Both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Ah, oh, isn't that good? In him, our Lord Jesus Christ prepares. This is right now. He sets a table for us among our enemies. He sets a table for us in the presence of mine enemies. In the fullness of times, there ain't going to be no enemies. There's not going to be any enemies. What? It's going to be glorious. Together with him. All together. All in Christ gathered and all in Christ together. Let me leave you with this. It don't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better than that. And that day is coming. And we owe everything to him. To our Lord, our Savior, our King, and our mercy seat. And thank God for it. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time and this place. Lord, be with Walter and Paul as they attempt, want, and try to proclaim your message in spirit and in truth. We preach as best we are able. We preach as best as you enable us be with them be with all your people wherever they are Lord be with us we know you are but Lord help us to to know it to believe it to trust you we need your help in this world in Christ's name we pray amen